about William Wordsworth's We Are Seven. This is a very strange poem, so let's get started. Again, just a reminder about how to read poetry. I apologize in advance if my dog barks. He just looked up. Nope, it's back to sleep. Okay. How to read poetry. Remember, we're always asking ourselves, how does the form of the poem help to create or disturb its meaning? You'll see in this poem, it's very simple. The form is very simple, but it's a very strange meaning that you might not expect given how simple it is. So that's a great example of the form creating meaning. To answer this, you must figure out the poet's form. How did the writer manipulate language? You do that by looking for patterns and weird things, things that stand out. And then you have to figure out the poem's meaning. What does it mean? How do the patterns and weird things make meaning? Expectations for annotations. You have to circle and look up every word you do not know. Write the definition in the margin. I know this is tedious, but guess what? That's how we learn. It gets easier, too. Number two, identify patterns and weird things. Rhyme scheme, imagery, speakers, etc. Oops. And three, figure out the literal meaning. What's literally happening? What is the story that's important to this poem? What is literally happening in this part? You want to figure out the greater meaning. What is the point? Why didn't the writer just say the meaning directly? What does the poetic form do for the meaning? Okay, a little bit about the author, William Wordsworth. He wrote this poem, or published it in 1798, so that would be the 18th century. He lived from 1770 to 1850. There's bajillions of internet pages about him because he was maybe the most famous English poet ever, besides Shakespeare. And a little note here of warning and caution, this kind of thing makes it very tempting to just Google it and find out what the internet says. And I'm telling you now, you will get zeros on papers if you're copying from the internet. The essay you're going to have to write does not require any outside research. Now, it's fine if you want to look things up just to get a clear sense. When you're writing your essay, it all has to be 100% from you, even if you're wrong. I like it when people are wrong. It means they're trying. Okay, back to Wordsworth. So here's what's really important to know about him. He really wanted to write poetry in the, quote, real language of men. And here he is, you know, like many people of his upper class status and high level of education, he didn't really know many real men, quote unquote, to begin with. So he's sort of making it up what he thinks, you know, poor people or the peasants, so-called. He's imagining and sort of fantasizing about what they would sound like, but, you know, he's trying. This poem, We Are Seven, comes from a collection called The Lyrical Ballads, written with Samuel Taylor Coleridge, another poet. He wrote The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. You may have read that in high school. This book, The Lyrical Ballads, is one of the most important books of poetry ever published in English. It initiated, I didn't write this anywhere, but you need to know this, Romanticism. Well, it didn't initiate it, but it was a big moment in a movement called Romanticism. So in case you ever hear that word used with regard to poetry or eras, the Romantic era, Wordsworth was one of its most famous poets. This poem is deceptively simple. Again, he's trying to write in the real language of men, in this case a little girl. Um, and these are the terms... Uh, that come up with the lyrical ballads. We've got a ballad, a story told in song or poetry, and then we've got lyric. Sorry, it's covered. Oops, it's on the next page. Poetry written to express emotion. So again, just cover this. This poem is deceptively simple. It looks simple. It's not that simple. There are speakers. Remember, this is an important literary term. You always want to figure out who is speaking. And in this case, it's a conversation between a little girl and the poet. So this is from the Lyrical Ballads collection. A ballad is a story told in song or poetry. And a lyric is a kind of poem written to express emotion. Okay, this is, speaking of graveyard poets, this is literally a photograph of me, that's me, looking at Wordsworth's grave. Last year, I, I, I went on a research trip 
and uh, it was January. I was cold. Um, I was trying to look deep. This was like kind of a joke. You know how he looks deep here? This is me trying to look deep and pensive as I contemplate Wordsworth's grave. Um, it's pretty silly. Okay, so let's look at the poem. Here we go. We Are Seven by William Wordsworth. And let's, let's do the simple things first. Figure out the rhyme scheme. Get a cool color going. Let's go for this rainbow sparkle. Okay. A simple, ch this is the first stanza. What do you notice about this stanza? Four lines, what do we call a four line stanza? Quatrain. Okay, that's a term you need to know. So it's a poem made up of quatrains. A simple child that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb. What should it know of death? Notice how I paused at the commas. Pausing at commas sounds like a simple trick. It really helps. So he's saying, a simple child that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb. It's kind of weird he's calling it an it, right? Remember, we look for weird things. That's a weird thing. It's not like draws her breath it's, or his breath. It's its breath. A simple child that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb. What should it know of death? All right. Remember, we got this like death thing going on. What should it know of death? So he's asking a question here. He's starting with a question. What does a child, what can a simple child know about death? It's a good question. What do kids know about death? Great question. Let's look at the rhyme scheme real fast. Child, A, always first line is always A. Anything else rhyme with child? No. Okay, what about breath is B. Anything else rhyme with breath here? Yes, death. Well, that's interesting. I would write about this, breath and death. The thing you lose when you die is your breath, right? It's interesting to rhyme those things. It kind of calls attention. And now what do we call limb here? Not, it's a C, so we've got A, B, C, B. That kind of sucks, it doesn't really rhyme. So let's see if this goes along here. Girl said curl head. So notice that the rhyme scheme has changed a bit here. Now it's A, B, A, B. What about this one? Air clad, fair, glad, A, B, A, B. So it looks like except for the first stanza, the first stanza is an exception. It looks like this poem is written in quatrains with an AB AB rhyme scheme. Sometimes there will remember like I said, there's sometimes there's exceptions to a, to a rule, which is why you have to check. It's weird, he breaks it, but also it's like it's the intro and there's kind of this thing here, it's like not quite a full line. All right. And now let's look at syllables. Let's maybe do the second stanza since the first one's irregular. Oh my doorbell. Hold on. Irregular. I'll pause for a second. So let's count the syllables in the second stanza. I met a cottage, oh wait, I met a little cottage girl. Let's, let's change the color. That's eight. She was eight years old. She said that's seven. Her hair was thick with many a uh, curl. Many is two, so, so that's like eight-ish. Doesn't always exact. That clustered round her head. Six. It's a little irregular. She had a rustic woodland air. Eight. She was wildly clad. Six. So it's eight, seven, eight, six. It's not going to be super regular, but these are shorter lines than the. Um, last poem we read. 
They're around eight or seven syllables each. It's very, it's not much to remark on. Oh, interestingly, it's around seven in the poems about being seven. We are seven. So maybe there's a connection. I don't know. Okay, let's keep going. Notice we don't really have to look any words up. Remember, Wordsworth talks in what he calls the real language of men. So these are not like difficult words and he's talking with a kid. So do children, what do children know about death? It's the first question. I met a little cottage girl. She was eight years old. She said her hair was thick with many a curl that clustered around her head. Okay. So he met a cottage girl, meaning she lives in a tiny cottage, probably not very rich. We're out in the countryside. You saw the picture of me at the graveyard. He's picturing it there, probably in that kind of area. She has curly hair. She had a rustic woodland air, meaning she seemed rustic, like from the country and from the woods. And she was wildly clad. Clad means dressed. So you would circle that and look it up. Her eyes were fair and very fair. Her beauty made me glad. Okay, so you're very... He's made happy by how pretty this little girl is. Slightly weird. It's definitely weird. Okay, notice here what, happened, what we get here. There's quotation marks. We've got someone speaking. Sisters and brothers, little maid. Maid just means young lady. Sisters and brothers, little maid. How many may you be? Okay end quote so that's one person talking how many seven in all she said and wondering looked at me okay she's like he's like how many of you are there in your family and she's like there are seven of us and she looked at me like kind of funny that's how I'm paraphrasing and where are they I pray you tell so he's like oh where are all your brothers and sisters she answered, seven are we, and two of us at Conway dwell. Okay, so Conway is like some town, I reckon. And two are gone to sea. So this is a time of war. So going to sea means possibly at war. Um, they might be soldiers or something. And these two are in town, so they, they might be a little older. So that's two and two. So that's four plus her is five. Two of us, notice how that there's a, so when you start a new paragraph, but the same person's still talking, you use another quote again. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother, and in the, cot in the churchyard cottage, I dwell near them with my mother. Okay. Boom. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother. What's she saying here? She's saying my brother and sister lie in the churchyard, meaning they're buried, they're dead. And in the churchyard cottage, I dwell near them with my mother. Okay, so she and her mom live in a cottage in the churchyard, in the graveyard, basically, where they live near her dead brother and sister. Notice here also, and in the ch churchyard cottage, I, if you want it to make sense, you say, and in the churchyard cottage, I dwell near them with my mother. But the line of poem ends here, because it's rhyming, Y and I. So, so she's saying, we live in the graveyard, where we live near my dead brother and sister. Okay, end quote, open new quote. You say that two at Conway dwell, and two are gone to see... Yet ye are seven, I pray you tell, sweet maid, how this may be. Okay, so the speaker here, is, the poet presumably, he's confused. Wait a minute here. How are you seven? Two of you are in Con Conway, two of you are at sea, then there's you, that's five, and two are dead, so there's only five of you. And she goes, then did the little maid reply, seven boys and girls are we, two of us in the churchyard lie beneath the churchyard tree you run above my little maid your limbs they are alive he's like you run above the ground if two are in the churchyard laid then ye are only five duh 
End quote. Their graves are green, they may be seen, the little maid replied. Oh, look, graves, green. We've, what do we call that? Alliteration. Their graves are green. It's also very singy, sing-songy, right? Look at the tone there. The tone, that's another technical term, the tone is sing-songy. The graves are green, they may be seen. And we've got some internal rhyme, like it rhymes within the line. So it's super sing-songy, like Dr. Seuss. Their graves are green, they may be seen. It's very childish and sing-songy, but guess what? She's talking about her dead brother and sister. That's weird. That's where we might look at an example of the form having an influence on the meaning, right? It's, it's like a sing-songy, childlike song. It's lyrical, it's a ballad, but it's talking about the deaths of children. And that should rub you a little wrong, like, oh, that's awkward. And then here we go, keep going. The little maid replied, 12 steps or more from my mother's door. They, and they are side by side. This is still her talking. My stockings there I often knit, my kerchief there I hem, and there upon the ground I sit and sing a song to them. Okay, you're certainly cheerful, right? But she's talking about she goes and knits stockings over her dead brother and sister's grave and sings a song to them. And often after sunset, sir, ooh, I'm thinking about Thomas Gray's poem here, when it is light and fair, I take my little porringer and eat my supper there. Porringer, you might want to look up. It's probably something that holds porridge. Like, her, she brings her oatmeal there for dinner. Here we go, up to line 49. Oh, we're getting some details. The first that died was Sister Jane. In bed she moaning lay, till God released her of her pain, and then she went away. Again, we've got a contrast in the tone, very sing-songy and childlike, with the subject, which is death. But God released her of her pain. I mean, that seems like a joyful thing, like she's no longer in pain. This is, we're getting some religion in here. So in the churchyard she was laid, and when the grass was dry, together round her grave we played, my brother John and I. Looks like, you know, they're sort of coping with her death by being around her. And when the ground was white with snow and I could run and slide, my brother John was forced to go, and he lies by her side. And now the quote ends. So she stopped talking. So, and then later in the year, so they, the grass was dry, like summertime, they played, and then it got white with snow. So we're looking at the passage of time, the seasons. They were, she was sliding on the grave. My brother John was forced to go. That's kind of a weird way to describe death, right? Forced to go. Remember, let's go back to the initial question here. What do simple children, what do they know of death? Well, it seems like they know quite a bit in this case. Remember, back then, this is 1798, so, like, people died younger and all the time and as children. It was very common. Back to this poet. How many are you then, said I, if they are two in heaven? Quick was the little maid's reply. Oh, master, we are seven. Like, he's just really confused. He's acting kind of dumb, right? She's being pretty clear. She still counts them as her brother and sister, even though they are dead. Oh, master, we are seven. Here, master is just a, a title, like what you call an older person. But they are dead. Those two are dead. Okay, notice here he's repeating himself. Those two are dead. He's like so confused. Those two are dead. Their spirits are in heaven. Ugh, twas throwing words away. For still the little maid would have her will and said, Nay, we are seven. All right, so we've got this last stanza here. I hope you notice something weird happening. What do you notice? No longer is it a quatrain. We've got five lines okay remember there was sort of one missing half a line missing at the beginning it looks like it's coming back to us at the end what about the rhyme dead heaven still will seven so the rhyme scheme is a little bit different we've got a b c c b heaven and seven still will 
So it's irregular. The final stanza you would say is irregular. Oops. Okay, Google. All right. They are dead. Those two are dead. Their spirits are in heaven. Look at all these exclamation points, too. He's like, this guy's pretty frustrated, right? They're dead. They're dead. Their spirits are in heaven. Just throwing words away for still. Notice also there's no comma here, and it makes it easier if you go. If you sort of ignore the line break. Twas throwing words away. Pause. For still the little maid would have her will. And said, nay, we are seven. Okay, so you've got conflict here between the little girl and the older speaker. The older man. Who's like, ugh. Two are dead. Little girl. And she's like, nope. Yeah, they're dead, but they're, they still count. Um, like I said, it's deceptively simple, right? We go back to the beginning. A simple child that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb. What should it know of death? This it is still strange. It's almost like he doesn't view the child as like a person who can think. Do you know what I mean? It's like an it. But we've got this really sing-songy poem. It's it's like do 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 playful little rhymes but it's it's pretty heavy it's about like what does a kid know when her siblings are gone and you know big families no birth control a um, couple maybe at war couple in town it's just her and her mom now she's pretty she's pretty much alone she lost the other two playfellows it's pretty heavy heavy stuff how does a child cope with heavy things um, that's what this poem is about. What does it mean? You know, that's up to you to sort of figure out. The, the speaker, the older person, just like doesn't get it. And the, the kid seems to get something that the older speaker is having trouble with. And, and that's kind of what this poem is about, you know, as far as I can tell. But you may have something else to say. Anyway, uh, again, this is what an annotation should look like. Uh, and these are the terms we're using. There's some illustrations to be done here. You could, you know, for extra credit. I hope this helps. Please email me if you.